Hello, everyone. My name is Tom Blassengame. I'm with Texas A&M University, and I have been asked to uh, present to you today. Um, I have been given the go-ahead to go on ahead and speak, so I'll do that now. I will provide this uh, presentation to you in a high-res format uh, via a video link. Um, if you sure. don't mind, please. Oh, okay. You're going to interrupt. Go ahead. Hello. Okay, so what I've asked the convener to do is to please mute everyone so that I can speak. And then uh, when we finish, if there's time, uh, we will have time for questions. If not, then I've asked that they monitor the chat and that those uh, chat questions be forwarded on. I do apologize. I have a very hard stop at the uh, top of the hour, actually a few minutes before for another meeting that I have to uh, go to. So thank you again for your time, and I will commence uh, the lecture, if that's OK. And I assume it is. So first of all, this is who I am, a little official bio. Uh, yeah, I look older now, and I probably need to go on a diet, but that's OK. Um, this is who I am, sort of in a, a brief bio, the things that you might want to know about me. Um, I've been teaching for about uh, 30 Five thirty-six years. I uh, began in 1983, and uh, as a student, and then I became a faculty member in um, the uh, February of 1991. Actually, on uh, Valentine's Day of all times. So, in that time, I've generated about 160 technical articles. I've had 14 PhDs and 68 masters. Uh, a lot of people say, why so few PhDs? And it's just PhDs with me are much more intimate. They're, um, they're people who are really self-motivated. I never really thought that much about it, but my PhD numbers are low. My MS numbers are a little high. Actually, I'm about to add two uh, in May to the PhDs and I think six or seven to the uh, masters. Had a big year, I'm not sure. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and improve that, no problem. And so that things have picked up tremendously for me, at any rate. Uh, in the early 1990s, and actually it was in the, the 1980s as well, I developed something that was called material balance decline curve analysis, and it became what you know as rate transient analysis. Uh, also did some work on water ratio, did some work on estimating various things from pressure transient test, including average reservoir pressure. Spent a lot of time on the so-called pressure integral and beta derivative for pressure transient and rate transient analyses. A lot of work on decline curve analyses and something called continuous CUR, which I'll demonstrate to you later on. Uh, did a lot of work on the diagnostic analysis of time rate data in the last few years. In my career, I've done a, quite a bit of work on correlations for rock and fluid properties. Uh, I'll direct you to my sites if you want to see those. Uh, I had a lot of work on deconvolution. That was something that I did myself uh, in my undergraduate uh, research as well as uh, have uh, directed several students on that. My research interest um, in the past year or so is still focusing on uh, production analysis and first transient analysis. Quite a bit of work in trying to correlate completions and production parameters. Been doing a bit of work on phase behavior and then, as usual, some sort of analytical solutions for reservoir flow solutions. So, looks like somebody has turned on a, an annotation device. Uh, I don't know how to turn that off. Um, it's a pen rather than, okay, well, I'll try to change. Nope, I am stuck. I have a, someone has turned on a pen. I need to turn that off, the annotation device. Where's that option? Maybe there, yep, thank you. Okay, so this is me. Um, I'll give you a couple of seconds to look at it and just tell you that I created this to kind of liven up the audience. Um, I had a, a great childhood, grew up in South Louisiana, and as you can see, uh, got away with a lot of shenanigans. 
I wasn't a bad kid. I just had a lot of uh, energy. Um, my father actually owned a drilling company, and I worked uh, with him as a child, spent all my time on rigs and so forth. But he unfortunately died rather tragically in uh, 1973, so I had to uh, sort of go on life. That was a seminal event. Um, and as you can see, sort of just a, a lot of little facts about me. Um, you know, there's some personal facts. I wasn't a very good student. Then I became a really good student. Uh, I did a lot of work with uh, different people. Um, I did start a software company one time and probably could have been rich, but it just wasn't the right thing for me. So didn't, didn't stick with that. And uh, probably not my nature to be an administrator. So kind of surprising that uh, I've been elected to uh, lead your SBE group. So I also created this little timeline to give you an idea of how long it takes to uh, to see yourself. Um, I visited with my advisor. I got to turn this off. Sorry, folks. Um, back, back in 1983, and I asked for an idea, and he gave me one, and uh, I began working on it. And he really didn't, you know, he just gave me something to get out of his office. So uh, I went and played with it and then realized that, you know, you could use uh, the clanker analysis with pressure theory and then did some simulations, then did some analytical work. And it, like I said, gradually it became what you know now as a uh, rate transient analysis. And this is just sort of a transcription of that. Um, I did have an interesting phone call from uh, Fetkovich in 1992, where he was angry at me for um, plotting data in a certain way. And you know, he uh, pretty much told me he wanted to see it plotted the other way. So I flipped it over. So there's two ways of doing RTA. I did write the first uh, RTA program back in 1997. I gave it away for a long time as a shareware. Um, Nobody knew or cared who I was until uh, the early 2000s, whenever the uh, vendors got involved. And of course, after that, it kind of took off. So um, just kind of giving you some idea that the uh, important thing is don't ever give up, you know, just keep working on your topic. I created these plots as also sort of a, a little bit of guidance on career paths. Uh, you'll notice over here the career path or career progress is on the y-axis time is on the x and you see these sort of uh, normal people you know low ambition people sort of look like this or very low pardon me low ambition looks like that and then modest ambition people like, look like that well then you have executives and executives like to do something get promoted do something get promoted do something get promoted or at least that's what the books tell us and then entrepreneurs um they have a completely different curve it looks sort of sawtooth they do something really innovative and they fall back down and have a really have a little bit of lag time, do something then they fall back down. And, but their curve is generally speaking, always up. And, and I admire people like that. I admire people who are willing to take risks. You know, I used to say that one of our faculty members, whenever he would get angry, he would create something new. Man, this is frustrating. I really do apologize about that. And then, uh, you know, he, he would just, he would have a lull and then he would do something really interesting and a lull and then do something interesting. And this is mine. This is my own career path. Uh, I left Louisiana, so that was a big jump up. And then there was some highs and lows and everything else. And people go, oh, didn't you intentionally draw it sort of as a flat line? No, I, I drew it as a decline. Um, because I think over the, the, the time you have to realize who you are and what you do. And other people have been more important than my own career. So I'm pretty happy with how things turned out for me. I'll just leave it at that. Okay, so this is how I spent the last uh, 37 years of my life working on uh, time rate and time rate pressure analysis. Uh, time rate can be thought of as a proxy model. You can use pretty much anything to represent it. Uh, time rate pressure has to have an analytical or numerical basis. You can use a proxy model for time rate pressure analysis, but it's a little more challenging and frankly, um, that proxy model has to have some basis. In fact, I'm, I really do apologize. The student is dropping things in a folder. Um, and then the full numerical time rate pressure analysis. I I let that, uh, the full, full numerical model, I leave that to others. I have a really close colleague who I work with and his expertise is full numerical solutions. So I leave that to him. But 
you know, I used to say the time rate analysis, I could teach my dog to do that. It takes a few minutes per well, maybe even less than that. There are a lot of people right now talking about automating this, which is a little bit dangerous, but it's probably going to happen. Time rate pressure analysis is a bit harder because the data has a lot more granularity to it. There's a lot more things that go into it. There's a description of the reservoir, a description of the completion, and so on. And that usually takes about an hour per well. And then when you look at a full numerical model, you have to load a geo model, you have, or you have to create a geo model, you have to create a PVT model, you have to uh, first uh, validate it and get it set up. And then once you finally get it running, it can take days to weeks. I've even seen simulation studies take years, uh, which is completely you know, unacceptable in the time frame of people wanting an answer, but that's true. So now we're on to the technical presentation, and this is where uh, all the other things sort of stop and the, the discussion about technical topics begins. I do apologize. This is going to be very much slighted towards my own experience. Um, it's, it's over time, it's been that I've tried to look at what other people have done and try to incorporate that into my own thinking. Um, for example, uh, I'll talk a little bit about the uh, nano core, nano volume uh, scale things that we work on in uh, our industry. And unfortunately, um, I can't function at that scale. Uh, what I do in terms of production analysis isn't feasible at that scale. Uh, I did have some students work on this. I, I, in fact, I had some students do a hell of a lot of really heavy work on this. It's also very difficult to model at that scale. Uh, there are a few people who continue to do that, even a couple of faculty at our own school. Uh, generally speaking, they come from a chemical engineering background, but my point is that at, at some point I gave uh, this some chalk, I, I worked on it, and then I said, you know, this is really someone else's domain, and it's not really going to affect what I do. Uh, I can make some more comments about that as we go through it as well. So this is a graphic that I was asked to create. It's actually called a Gartner hype cycle, and I have been working um, in a consulting capacity on uh, how to evaluate the performance of uh, oil and uh, gas shale wells. And, you know, there there has to be, uh, I'll orient you to it, it's just those vertical scales just sort of relative. It's called visibility. And then there's a time scale, but there he's isolated some things. There's a technology trigger. There's a peak of inflated expectations. There's a trough of disappointment. There's a slope of enlightenment. And then a plateau of productivity. So there had to be a trigger, and the trigger for our industry was multi-fracture horizontal wells. One of the other triggers was the proximity to the domestic market. In other words, most of these gas shales uh, were close to a market, for example, near the Dallas-Fort Worth area for the Barnett shale, uh, sort of near the Dallas-Fort Worth area for the Haynesville shale. Uh, some of the other shales are in that region as well. Uh, some of the ones which are further south uh, Eagleford, for example, not near a market, but not really that far. It is close to a sales point, for example, in Corpus Christi. The Marsalis Shale in Pennsylvania, very close to the eastern seaboard, which uh, means they can sell gas to almost anyone, anytime. There was an emphasis on lower carbon, um, which really pushed up uh, gas, uh, and you can see the gas price uh, was accelerating at that time. And then there was a perception, people got really arrogant and they said, you know what, we can create wells that have a high initial potential and a high EUR on demand. We're so smart that we can do that. The truth is different, we can't. Um, this was where this peak occurred. And then we thought that micro seismic would lead to a great deal of understanding, trying to identify sweet spots and so on. Uh, then property just went really expensive. Uh, there was a discussion the other day about how leasing cost for property reached thirty, forty thousand dollars an acre in some of the early shale gas plays. Uh, I've seen prices as high as sixty thousand in some of the oil cases. Uh, gas prices, of course, when you flood the market, the price drop, and you had stakeholder concerns. Uh, sweet spot identification was where people finally realized you're going to have to drill enough wells to identify whether or not you have a play. Uh, there are some shales that did not make the cut. The ones that you read about. Um, that did make the cut, that did very well. They had something about them. They were easier to produce. They were overpressured. They high, had high, uh, high total 
organic content or something like that. Water management became a really big issue, how you stimulate with water in an arid environment or an environment where water is very precious. Uh, seismic exploration, this is more or less put in for one of the managers who really felt like seismic was going to uh, enable more. I'd probably move that one to over here actually because uh, seismic exploration has really led to uh, a lot more uh, of understanding how complex the subsurface is. Reservoir modeling began being more important, uh, completion optimization, uh, then joint venture funding, getting someone else to pay for it. Oil prices strengthen, multi-well pads, now all wells are drilled from a single uh, pad if you're going to do two, four, six, eight, sometimes even uh, the highest number of wells on a pad I've seen is 32. Um, then reservoir sweet spotting, this was intensive well targeting, both vertically and laterally. And then consolidation of acreage and again, uh, late sort of completion optimizations, which became very, very large treatments. Now, I've not really edited this in a couple of years, but again, if I were to put some other things out here, um, you know, it might be price leveraging, it might be uh, you know, optimization of those very large treatments. The important thing to realize is this didn't happen overnight. This took about 10 years. Uh, there was a lot of money invested that was wasted, but there was also a lot of time invested that was very valuable for that. Now, I'm not gonna ask you a quiz question, but I will tell you that this morning, in the United States, uh, the oil price is lower than it's ever been uh, for the last 30 something years and it dropped to almost $10 a barrel in West Texas, which is a sign uh, because most of West Texas is this um, liquid rich system. It's a sign that the oversupply is really devastating the price. Uh, this is something that we are gonna have to live with. So I'll speed up a little bit. Um, these are, uh, some results of an exercise that I did in 1917, oh, sorry, 2017, sorry, 2017, my apologies for that, I'm not that old. And I pose these questions as a crowdsourcing exercise and I've taken some of the answers. I won't read them to you, but I'll tell you that the important ones really are this so-called parent-child relationship where you have an older well that you drilled in order to hold the acreage, then you come back in and you drill uh, new wells and you find that things are much different than you expected there was depletion it's not depletion necessarily of the matrix rock but it is depletion of the, the the rock that is in contact with the fracture system which is just as bad uh, the oil is still down there the actual recovery of uh, oil in these plays is really low it's on the order of five six percent um, so it's a huge opportunity for eor and there has been a, a lot of effort uh, to try to scale EOR, to try to test EOR. Uh, EOR is not going to be very viable right this moment, uh, obviously with price crashing and so on. Other things as people were looking at is, uh, you know, can we see something to do with uh, using, uh, you know, economics and looking at how things changed uh, versus just following the herd and you know, this herd mentality is not as crazy as you might think. I mean, there are a lot of companies that were created to go into the shales, uh, probably well over 100, maybe 200 uh, that were created simply to buy real estate and try to develop shales. Um, a lot of them did not have a technical background. They were just trying to, like a real estate company, they were trying to wait and see who moved in the neighborhood and then get bought out. Uh, there were a lot of other questions about uh, the data that, and the information that will be needed to continue to develop a shale play, uh, you can see those comments at the bottom. So with that, I'll step away from these general discussions and talk about something very specific. Uh, a guy by the name of Phil Nelson, uh, you'll read about some of his papers in the uh, geology and petrophysics literature. He worked for the United States um, Geological Society and did a very, very good job he created this chart back in 2009 before anybody was even thinking about this. The vertical scale itself has no meaning. It's just sort of to show the scale of things. Now, when I was your age, we wanted only to be over here in the sands, maybe over here a little bit in the silts, but you can see the Tyler seed size. Uh, this is the kind of thing that you would do in uh, your uh, core lab or your petrophysics lab. 
And when you're down on this level of 325 uh, sieve size, it's basically dust. So, you know, this is very hard to try to um, reconcile. Excuse me, can you please mute? I can hear you typing in the background. Thank you. So this sieve size scale gives you an idea. Okay, so this is a factor of 10 smaller, factor of 10 smaller, factor of 10 smaller, factor of 10 smaller, factor of 10 smaller. So we're six orders of magnitude smaller in terms of what we were looking at. So that's a million times smaller than what we were looking at uh, 35, 40 years ago. So his point was, is that, okay, some of the pore sizes of things he were looking at were down here on the order of uh, one hundredth of a micrometer or 10 nanometers. So the important thing when you're looking at that is how big is the molecule? And the molecule itself is here in this uh, section. Again, please uh, mute yourself if you don't mind. It's beginning to distract the conversation. So the, the actual molecule size, if you're looking at individual species, is pretty small. It fits in down here. You know. So the way you're, you're trying to think about this is that if you were looking at a pore size, you would expect that pore to be filled with molecules that are fairly small, that they would form films, that we would have the Klinkenberg effect be valid, or we would have Darcy's law be valid, or we would have other things be valid because it's behaving as a fluid. But whenever you move to the size where the size of the room and the size of the molecule are on the same order, it's, then it's like having beach balls in the hallway, you know, and these um, physical phenomena such as Darcy's law, they no longer are valid for that con uh, particular configuration. So just sort of to give you some guidance, you know, a geologist was thinking about how this would affect our ability to understand flow and porous media. And if I leave you with anything, think about it this way. We're looking over here, this would be your Wari or your offshore Nigeria type sandstone reservoirs. And we're moving down a million times smaller or 10 million times smaller uh, into that domain. So this is gonna be very hard to model and to understand the, the, the rigor of flow in those systems. As I mentioned, I've had students work on this. And to be honest, the uh, surprising thing is you can model it uh, and you can model it very well, but it's not practical. It would just take entirely too long to ride, try to run a reservoir simulator at that scale. So let's see what we're really talking about. This is actually the Haynesville Shale. I don't know if you can see that. I'll try to mark it over here, sorry. So that's the Haynesville Shale. That is, uh, generally speaking, it's in uh, northwest Louisiana and uh, northeast Texas. Um, it is contiguous with another shale called the Bozier Shale. The Haynesville is generally thought of as being a little bit higher quality, and there's some sort of demarker where the Bozier Shale becomes a Haynesville or vice versa. But um, and the Bozier is more pronounced in Texas than it is in. Um, I'm going to decline this because I'm trying to uh, present. Okay, so you have or organic porosity, which is these little tiny holes inside of this organic particle. And that organic particle is a piece of shale. That piece of shale is trying to, um, it's been deformed. You can see all the rock particles around it. But what caused these holes to form is probably the generation of the oil and gas itself. So you can see all of these black spots here and here and here and here. These are all, generally speaking, the pore space that one would expect in a shale. And the first thing, your first question you should ask is, how are those pore spaces connected? And the simple answer is they're probably not. So, you know, this is very difficult for fluid to be expelled from these. Although, of course, over time, you have been of a lot of fluid being and so forth, but just for you to get a feeling for the scale that you might be looking at. Okay. So as you know, it's hard to come by uh, data in the industry um, where people will actually permit you to publish it and so on. So what I'm going to do is I'm gonna refer you to this dissertation, which I found online and assumingly it's public data. There are a number of these kinds of permeability porosity profiles out there 
but this one came from an academic resource, so I don't feel like I'm violating anything. What this person was trying to show was the effect of total organic carbon or reservoir quality, if you want to think about it. This scale is nano Darcy, so this is one millionth of a milli Darcy. So we're looking at a nano Darcy scale. So one million nano Darcy's would be one milli Darcy. So this is extremely small. This is one thousand nano Darcy's, which would be one micro Darcy. So this is still extremely small permeability, and you can see the profile. Now they plot geologists like to plot this as a logarithm on the x scale and a uh, Cartesian on the Y, they always use percent, of course, as well. And they're describing this in terms of what the actual rock looks like. But then when she comes back and she plots it in terms of total organic carbon, you'll notice that the less total organic carbon, the less permeability. And then the more total organic carbon, the more permeability. How can that be? Well, it's pretty obvious that the more organic carbon you have, the more pore space you're going to create, and hence, the higher permeability. Now, there's a lot of debate over what's the right way to calculate permeability and so forth, but you know, we'll we'll say this is probably okay. And you know, these measurements are extremely difficult to make. They're um, they're only done in precision laboratory uh, conditions and so on. It's not something you could do in school, that sort of thing. You might be able to get away with a proxy for this if you were doing this in a uh, uh, using mercury capillary pressure, but I wouldn't recommend that conversation right now. We'll talk about that some other time. So now, very quickly, a, a discussion about uh, bubble point suppression. So as we talked about before, what we're looking at is very small pore spaces. You can see that this is no, no confinement, which means it's not a pore space that's really small. And then, uh, of course, these are all simulation studies. So this is two nanometers, which is an extremely small can find four nanometers, five nanometers. And you can see that at this constrained um, or confined scenario, you drop the bubble point from 5,500 PSI to somewhere around 2,800 PSI. So you drop the bubble point by almost half. This is the so-called bubble point suppression. Now that's an extreme case. And you can also see some of these didn't exactly agree with that, but that's okay. The important thing is we know there's some sort of a feature where the critical temperature and critical pressure are altered by this behavior. You can also see someone's trying to show the pore size uh, effect on the formation volume factor. So essentially it's dropping the bubble point pressure and moving the B sub O profile this way. Bulk means that it behaves as a, a normal fluid, a normal uh, hydrocarbon mixture. This would be where that fluid would be dependent upon the uh, confinement. So I'll leave it with that for, for now. Uh, again, we did a lot of work on this in the early uh, parts of oil uh, uh, ex uh, oil development or uh, shale oil development, but I just want to make sure that everybody understands that, you know, this is, there are some people still working on this or even a couple at my university. There's a couple at probably every university, but this is really more of a scientific endeavor than actually something that would be applied. Now, the, the, uh, results of this help guide us in understanding where we should and shouldn't uh, develop a shield. But I just want to make sure that everyone understands, practically speaking, this still has had a relatively small impact on what we do. Uh, this is a, just a correlation that I made. Uh, I have a database, I just want to show you very quickly, that I got from someone that was an industry maintained database. And what you can see is that database is pretty broad. I put some Eagleford data, some Delaware data, a mystery case, and I tried to correlate that with the previous correlation, and it didn't work very well. But when I look at only the uh, these cases, the, the uh, take the, the big database out and put this database in, then what you can see is you get a very good correlation. So what this message really is, is um, these volatile and uh, condensate type fluids they don't correlate necessarily very well with the historical databases, but they do correlate very well in sort of a near critical um, PVT or phase behavior type database. I'll need to speed up just a little bit. This is a discussion about choke management. There was a lot of work done on choke management early in the development of shales, and in particular, 
there was uh, efforts that were trying to uh, minimize the impact on estimated ultimate recovery by uh, using a choke setting that was relatively low. Uh, then people realized that they needed, you know, if you keep your choke low, then your rates will be low and your payout will be much longer. So then people are saying, well, let's increase the uh, choke systematically. Let's see how that affects um, performance. And the net result of that is you had a lot of work done on people trying to manage their choke changes. You can see this cartoon explains ramping up the choke change. So here, what they're doing is this is a um, pressure drop divided by rate or inverse productivity index. So they do the first choke change and the next choke change and the next choke change and the next choke change. And then it sort of evens out and you have a trend that you believe you can analyze. Um, there was a lot of work done in some of the major plays, the Haynesville, for example, it was thought best to never go above a 14 inch, uh, 14 64th choke. Um, in the Niobrara Codell in Colorado, uh, it depended on well length. There was a, a rule of thumb for short laterals, which was about a kilometer and a half, which was uh, 14, then longer laterals, which was about two kilometers, which was uh, 16, and then uh, much longer laterals, which was almost three kilometers, which was 18. You know, sometimes people played around with this more than they really needed to. There was, or pardon me, there were a few cases where it was clear that aggressive choke behavior did harm to the performance. Um, those are not something that it's clear to explain right now in the context of looking sort of at a cartoon, but there were cases where people increased the choke much too rapidly and actually caused damage probably to the fracture system. Um, I, I was uh, consulted on a couple of cases where it was clear that that had happened. But then later on, there was another case where that did, uh, or there was another reservoir development in West Texas where that did not happen. There was never uh, going to be uh, an effect really of the choke. Uh, you didn't want to uh, turn the choke on uh, too fast, too quickly uh, over maybe the course of a few days, maybe a couple of weeks. Um, because you didn't want to shock your system. You also didn't want to uh, potentially affect your tubulars and uh, possibly, I guess, you could affect the downhole condition like producing too much sand. There were a few operators that were trying to, uh, you know, accelerate the choke as quickly as they could and basically went to wide open within a couple of days. Uh, I came back and looked at what uh, Dean, Dahl, and Tucker did, and I more or less just interpreted that as a continuous change until they finally achieved, once they stopped changing the choke, they finally achieved a consistent trend. So that's what all that is really about. And the next slide is a series of relatively simple gas cases. There are three different shale gas fields, A, B, and C. Uh, this is a case that I developed with a student of mine who is, is now in industry and uh, looks at this sort of thing all the time. We just thought it would be a nice sort of a comparison set of data. So what you're looking at is gas production rate on a logarithmic scale for each case, production time on a Cartesian scale. And we're trying to say, okay, how do these wells compare? Why is this well relatively low and this well relatively high? And the simple answer is there is no simple answer. There's probably some geologic reasons. There may be some uh, well completion regions. Uh, there may be all sorts of different things. And then you can see a case like this where you have a well that's just a monster compared to some wells which are, well, not monsters. And then you can see that there's some wells down here at the lower end that struggle a great deal. They're having a lot of problems uh, staying online, which is generally a sign of liquid loading. So then we decide, well, let's turn it around and look at gas produced versus humid production. So this is Cartesian gas production versus humid production. The trends are smoother-ish, uh, but they're not more clear. They're not, there's no sort of characteristic DNA, and that's what we're looking for, is what's the DNA of all of these? And yeah, again, this well was a monster. By the way, there have been some wells in the Utica Point Pleasant formation that have uh, had initial production potential of well over 60 to 70 million cubic feet a day. So some of this uh, early hype about, you know, being able to produce high IPs has come true, uh, but it's in very limited place. And then, of course, you can see this well still struggling. And you can see sort of maybe a slight trend of evidence that 
the less a well struggles, the better it is. But we're still looking to see if there's some sort of DNA. And in order to do that, we'll have to add pressure. So uh, before we do that, we'll talk a little bit about the computed decline constant, which is the rate divided by the derivative. And or, sorry, it's the reciprocal of that, my apologies. And then the B factor, which is the derivative of that. And what we're looking for is how do these actually behave? And you can see it's a little bit rough because he did not smooth the or, or extract uh, information out of it. But I've imposed a slope of one, which would be essentially for hyperbolic decline. And you can see this one actually lines up pretty well. This one's a bit noisy. And then we take the derivative again of the reciprocal of this function and we get a shotgun scatter, but still we can see that some of these are in the vicinity of two, which we'll talk about in a moment as a linear flow regime. This one's somewhere in the middle. This one's a lot of uh, scatter, but the goal really is to show that there can be some diagnostics from these parameters. Next, we tried to normalize it with pressure drop, and that did not work as well as we had hoped. We, we were kind of hoping, and I've seen this attempted by other companies as well to create a pressure and rate function that would normalize this out. I just, there's something else going on. It's more than just the uh, pressure can convey. So uh, it did smooth out the trends. You can see that they, they all have a different character now. Uh, once we incorporate pressure, it's much clearer. So that did help in, from that standpoint, but it did not clear up uh, any questions about quote unquote DNA. The student that uh, I was working with at the time created a beta derivative function, which is a derivative divided by um, the uh, rate function. And it was supposed to show that when you reached a certain criteria that there was a, a certain expectation with that. You can see this particular group is approximately one. This particular group's got a bit of noise, but it's also approximately one. This particular group doesn't ever get to one, but some of the trends appear to be approaching it. So this again was just a diagnostic from the student. Next is uh, an attempt to try to create some of the traditional RTA type plots. This is rate normalized pressure drop. This is pressure like rate. These are log log plots. This is an attempt to see a certain genetic behavior. And you can see uh, there's a bit of a signature here. There's definitely a signature here. Uh, there's probably a signature here, but it actually switches from one to another. Uh, we flip these over. That's all this really is, is this rescaled. Uh, looks sort of, you know, obviously it's a mirror image, but maybe there are some trends in here. You can see that if we count blocks, one block down, two blocks over, that's the uh, one half slope trend. That would be linear flow. And of course, it'd be the same thing over here. One block up, two blocks over, that would be linear flow. So there's definitely evidence of expected flow regimes here but it's on an individual basis. So we'll talk a little bit about how to maybe get something out of that. So if we have linear flow, everyone in the industry says we should take the square root. So if we take the square root, we get trends that look like this, and they are linear-ish. Uh, this is not linear, that doesn't look linear, that might be linear. And it's really hard to see that any of this is linear, but there, there are some linear-ish behaviors over here. Uh, maybe you could call this linear as well. The important thing about that is I'm not a big feel, uh, fan, as everyone knows, of taking the square root. I do use it, and I will talk about it a little more, but it just confuses things. I much prefer looking at things on a log-log scale. Okay, so now what we'll do is we'll say we take one of the reference curves, one of the better curves that we like. We're going ahead and put a line through it. That'll be our half-slope line, and then we'll have some sort of a tail coming off of it. Uh, which we can design, we can use uh, some sort of a proxy model for that. And then we have another well over here. So this is well A, which is the reference well. This is the other well that we want to compare to the reference well. So the way we do this is we make a proxy, which is this line connected with this line. And then we'll move the green onto this line by scaling or multiplying uh, the X and Y axes by a factor. And so once we achieve that, uh, we obtain a match here. So then those factors can come over here to this plot and they can be compared. In this case, he's used uh, X multiplied by Y and then simply the Y. And he shows sort of a characteristic behavior. He's also plotted uh, these functions in this fashion to show what this uh, might look like. 
uh, if, if you were to map this behavior. So each one of these wells would have their own uh, X and Y factors, and then you could see if it had some relevance to reservoir properties. There's a lot more work goes into this than this, but I just wanted to get an idea for how you would compare uh, one set of data to another. And maybe if you could establish a reference model, you could compare that. What you're really looking for is, uh, and I call it a genetic signature, which would be this, then tied to that. And most wells will follow a common signature. The shifting is really governed by reservoir properties as well as the completion. Okay. Speeding up a little bit again, this is a diagram. It is a reservoir simulation. This is gas flow rate on a logarithmic scale, time on a logarithmic scale. This is the linear flow trend that we talked about. This is a multi-fracture horizontal well. You can see the pressure profile is only isolated around the fractures, which is when we get linear flow. And then we sort of peel away from linear flow and we see an interference relationship. That's called the stimulated reservoir volume that would occur at this point. And then we have sort of a, a strange, it's called pseudo pseudo steady state. Um, this is actually an artifact. It's not really one, but it looks like one. And then sometime later, we have a secondary system, which is when the beyond SRV performance begins. So this pseudo pseudo steady state for this particular case approaches five to six years. And then this secondary regime is about 40 years. The important thing to realize here is that this um, relationship, this linear flow behavior is related to the so-called hyperbolic rate time uh, equation. But more importantly, that you know this takes uh, a relatively long time before this regime diminishes. And then you know these are really relatively low rates before we see them start to um, affect um, the behavior over here again. So this is completely non-economic, this beyond SRV. From a practical standpoint, this wouldn't be relevant. So most of the time you're gonna see us focusing only on sort of this period. This is one of the reasons that people consider a 30 year time frame for a shale gas or a shale oil well. And again, this feature of looking at it as a half slope, uh, which becomes a B factor of two, uh, is going to be important to us in just a moment as well. Okay. So these are some public data cases that we took from the literature in uh, this is public uh, information in the United States. And we took this from the literature and I had a, a person helping me with this. So these are the number of wells that were in those samplings. And this is the P50 well. So this was all of these wells and then their P50 well converted from that. You can see that the Barnett uh, shale was the lowest productivity case, but it produced for a very long time, had a very effective uh, production regime and so on. And then the uh, Woodford and the uh, Fayetteville shales, and then the Marsala shale, and then uh, the Haynesville, uh, Texas, and then the Haynesville, Louisiana shale. A lot of people ask, why is the Marsala shale so uh, broken? because in all other states, you're required to report data on a monthly basis, but in Pennsylvania, which is where this well, or this uh, sequence of data was taken from, it was on six months. So the statistics aren't quite as good. These blue markers indicate the start of linear flow. The uh, red and, and blue markers indicate the end of linear flow. So this is actually something that we've observed looking at samples of thousands of wells. So this actually makes sense now. Well, I told you I didn't like square root, but I'm gonna do it anyway. So this is cumulative production versus square root of time. And we take these starter markers, transfer them here, take these end markers, transfer them here. And you can see this is a straight line. This is a straight line. This is a straight line, straight line. And then a very, very long straight line. The Barnett has a notorious, uh, very long linear flow period. And you're saying, well, so what, Tom? Well, if you extrapolate this straight line, you will significantly overestimate EUR. So there has to be something uh, tied to uh, constrain that extrapolation. We can talk about that later on as well. Now we'll talk a little bit about reservoir pressure. This will be pressure transient analysis. All I really want you to recognize here is that, yeah, they did a, a pretty good job uh, with this calculated bottom wall pressure. That's the uh, blue circles. Uh, this is the gauge. And then the buildup occurs, and there's a nice buildup, and then they put it back on production, and the, the calculated pressures match pretty well. Uh-oh, 
what happened here? Well, I, the, I picked an extreme case, but this is not my case. This is somebody from the literature, but this happens all the time, especially in heavy multi-phase uh, regimes. You can calculate the bottom hole pressure for, during the production period fairly accurately, but getting the uh, bottom hole pressure calculated during a buildup can be extremely challenging, which is right here. And I just want everyone to understand this is a major emphasis of the kind of things that we do in reservoir engineering of unconventional. So a lot of people say, you know what? I don't want to measure bottom hole pressure, but there are probably somewhere between just a rough garden guess, 800 wells with Pioneer, probably 200 wells with Oxy, maybe 300 wells with Oxy. There's probably on the order of 2,500 to 3,000 wells in West Texas with um, measured bottom hole pressure devices of some sort in them. Uh, very quickly, this is a case from the Marsalis in Pennsylvania. This is a pressure transient test. It's a very old paper. It was 2011. You may argue with the interpretation, but what the individual is trying to show is there's a buildup. He matched the buildup very well. Um, you'll notice that he matched it using a dual porosity reservoir model, which is probably not right. But at the time, that was what people were thinking they wanted to do. He did not use um, a horizontal multi-fracture model. He only used a single well model to match a very complicated multi-fracture well model behavior. And then you'll notice that he's also showing that there's a slight interference with this offset well, again, matching it with a dual porosity model. I just wanted to show you that there's very few literature examples of uh, pressure transient analysis. These are some cases from the Bakken Shale in North Dakota. Uh, what you'll notice is very good, not, looks like a simulator, very nice data set, very nice derivative marking here. Um, and then this particular case, not quite as good. Um, there's some hiccups, maybe some offset operations, if I were guessing. Um, they might be stimulating offset and it might be interfering slightly. That is sometimes what it looks like in the pressure derivative, but overall, pretty good match, uh, overall pretty good match on the, the pressure profile throughout. Um, it's hard to look at something like this and say, okay, is it really worth it to do this? Because there aren't any reservoir properties per se. You're going to have to work your way around to some sort of assumption or, or consensus value permeability, but understanding that you did achieve the shape that you were looking for during this period is good. So this shape that you're looking at is characteristic of a horizontal multi-fracture well, uh, as is this one. Uh, this shape might be a little, little bit lower conductivity. Uh, this shape might be a little bit higher conductivity, but the question really is, you know, what can you do with that? And it would be something that you could compare to your completion if you wished. Next is um, something that's a little more of a circus. Um, this particular company put gauges in all four wells. We're looking into the formation, so, uh, this would be like, uh, we call this a gun barrel or a wine rack view. So from a surface position, it, it might look like these wells are all on the line, but from a subsurface position, looking into the formation, you're going to have this diamond pattern of wells. So they call it pop, which is putting on production. And they're watching what happens when they put on production well number three, which is here. Well, there's a reaction in well number four. There's a very slight reaction in well number six, but there's virtually no reaction in well number five. And then they put well number six on production and you can see what happens with well number six is it reacts, um, of course, if you can see it, there's a slight reaction in well number four, there's a slight reaction in well number three, there's essentially no reaction in well number five. So they came up with a formulation for a derivative of looking at these uh, pop events, these putting on production events, and it's based on the derivative, and they're trying to understand how conductive uh, the nearby behavior is based on the magnitude of this derivative. Very clever, if you want to call it that, approach to this problem. They're, they're, there's a fundamental model that they believe is relevant. There are other people who don't. Uh, some people believe that this model is uh, relevant for you know, modeling, the, it's called anomalous diffusion. Others, myself included, believe it's probably something more related to dual porosity or a uh, fracture uh, dominated system or a fractal system. 
Hey, very quickly, uh, what does a fracture system look like on a flow profile? So in this case, my student took different fracture configurations and generated flow profiles. The flow profiles themselves don't look that much different for a very, very different configuration of fractures. This would be what we'd expect for a nice uh, homogeneous, all fractures of the same dimension. This is one where the fractures are different dimension and kind of tilted. And then this is one where the fractures are just crazy. And you can see the shapes of these particular profiles is not that much different. I know you're looking at it going, hey, that's a lot of different, Tom, but they're not as much different as you would think. And the surprising thing is we really don't see a lot of uh, linear flow characteristic here. And, and there could be a variety of reasons why it could have something to do with uh, the numerics on how this uh, particular run was started. But uh, we, we impose the linear your flow regime to show what it looks like, but we're not sure what that's going to do for us. So there's no real strong diagnostic behavior here. So let's pretend that you did not have the models that I took these little red patches off. And I said, we have three wells here. Tell me what's different about them. Well, you really couldn't say, you know, I'm not trying to get you to use inductive logic and say that if you see something different, it must be complex fracturing. But I am getting trying to get you to say, hey, I'm sure, you know, the complexity of the fracture system can have an effect, but I also see I don't know how to resolve that. So as we come to the close, uh, very quickly uh, talking about time rate relationships, this is the so-called modified hyperbolic. Uh, you know, I often say this is the dollar of the oil and gas industry. You may not like it, but this is what things are priced in. And the modified hyperbolic or the... Uh, early hyperbolic late exponential model is the one that's used for reserves. People first look at the rate time profile. They say, oh, that's got a nice uh, one half slope to it. Then they look at the derivative of the uh, rate profile. So it's given down here. This is the definition. It's minus one over Q dQ dt. Take the reciprocal of that and we'll use it down here for the B factor. But we calculate this using a derivative algorithm. And I've sketched in what that particular profile should look like. So really not a bad match, it's actually pretty dang good. And then we come down, we calculate the B factor from these red data points. We take the inverse of the reciprocal and calculate it from that. And you can see how well that turns out. Very nice uh, profile, actually. This is an unusual case that has such a strong B equals two signature. But overall, what it tells you is that this, you know, it's gas well. Um, it does have, and I, I believe if I recall correctly, it's a Hainesville gas well, it has a very strong um, linear flow profile for a long duration. So this would be an example of where the so-called modified hyperbolic works. Now, what you have to decide is how you're going to terminate that function. So this extrapolation just keeps going on, but somehow we have to terminate that. And we terminate that with this late exponential. So at some switch point, we will turn this late exponential on and it will, it will cause this to decay and it will give it a finite um, estimated ultimate recovery. So then we have what's called the power law exponential relationship, and this was derived from observations. These were the, the red data are the edit, edited flow rates, pardon me, and we take the derivative of those flow rates, divide by rate, and that gives us this D function. There's two versions of the D function. I must, I apologize if that confuses people, but the, the from rate is uh, using rate cumulative, and from time is using uh, time rate data, so focus on um, the one that's underneath at the blue points, if you will. And you can see that that straight line is strongly unique, and that's actually what we defined the definition, or we defined the relationship on this uh, observation of this straight line uh, relationship. Now, I will tell you that uh, in this in 2008, uh, someone referred us back to a paper from 1942 where they did exactly the same thing. They didn't know what to do with it, but they literally did exactly the same thing. They plotted uh, this D behavior on a, a chart. Uh, so, you know, there, I'm not saying that, you know, there aren't pioneering ideas, but in 1942, they didn't know what to do with that. So the winner over time was the hyperbolic, not some variation of that. But this particular model seems to have some merit. Now we added the so-called D infinity term uh, which would be when this goes linear down here, and that causes the rate profile to drop. Oh, sorry, the rate profile to drop right here. So it also 
causes the B factor to drop when you're calculating as well. The most important thing you recognize is the B factor is not constant. So given this D, this B factor is not constant. That's a very big thing because a lot of people think the B factor is constant. Of course, this data tells you it's not. Another function is the so-called stretched exponential. And without delay, I'll just tell you that the stretched exponential is exactly the same as the uh, power law exponential. It's just formed in a different way. The next is a relationship called the Duong method. And for those of you on LinkedIn, uh, he's currently touting this method as one of the ways to predict or variation of this method to predict uh, COVID, um, the, the virus uh, propagation. Um, it is a model of his own construction. It does have some very specific assumptions built into it. The bottom line is it's a bit of an overestimator. And if this particular plot in this box is not observed, if this behavior is not observed, this model does not apply. This is its um, condition for existence. So dividing rate by cumulative production and plotting that versus days, if that particular function is not a straight line, this model really does not apply. So I'll close with that and just show you these uh, cases of oil well performance with some extrapolations, uh, gas well performance with some extrapolations. The important thing to say is that given this match, you can't tell which model is best, but given these extrapolations, you can see a tremendous difference in the range of projected gas in place. The same thing is true, or oil in place, pardon me. The same thing is true when you're looking at the gas equation, you can see a tremendous difference in the extrapolations. This is not done to confuse you or to suggest that one model is better than the other. It is done to explain that certain models have a certain trajectory built into them. The Duong method, as I mentioned, has a trajectory that's very, uh, generally very high. Uh, sometimes not, but most of the time it is. And you can see it in blue on this case and in pink on this case. Whereas the exponential, the stress exponential, the parallel exponential, they have uh, a function built into them, which is generally going to terminate uh, in a much more rapid fashion. I think in the interest of time, I'll uh, stop there because I have to go to my other meeting, I apologize. I'll take your uh, comments from your student chapter as they send them. Um, I, I will recast the questions into something that I can try to answer. I will provide this video to you uh, via your student chapter. I'll, I'll post it in a place where they can pull it. And I, I sincerely apologize. I, I have to go to my other meeting now. Uh, I do appreciate the opportunity to present to you and I look forward to uh, future communications. So my best wishes and my thanks for our time together. Okay. Hello, doctor. Yes. Can you hear me? Hello, doctor. Yes, I'm here, but I have to leave. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, uh, yes. Say thank you on behalf of the student chapter. This is Amarachi Okibu. Ah, okay, nice to meet you. Thank yes, <laughs> nice, same, same. Okay, so I wanted to say thank you on behalf of the student chapter, and I will send the questions to you, and then share oh, the perfect. materials with those who have attended the lecture today. Absolutely perfect. Thank you. And again, I will uh, forward this to you. It'll probably be sometime late tonight, your time, or early tomorrow, your time. Um, but I'll, okay. I'll forward the uh, video to you, etc. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you too. Thank you very much, sir. Okay. All right. So if you have any questions, you could just type them in the chat section and I will put it all together and send it to him and then share the materials and answers to you when he sends it to me. So thank you all. For okay, so you can you can type your questions now before we end the <coughs> lecture. And if you want to reach out to the student chapter for the materials, you could send us an email. I will type our email in the chat section. So you could send us an email, and then we would share the materials with you. We could also share it through the Lagos section.
Okay, so we have officially um to an end. We have officially come to an end of this presentation. We'll leave the chat sector open to collect the questions for about 10 minutes, then we would end the presentation. If you want a copy of the materials like the president of the Society of Petroleum Engineering, Covenant University student chapter said, you can send an email. The email is in the chat section. It is Covenant U, like letter U, Covenant U students, students is plural, S-T-U-D-E-N-T-S, at spemail.org. The email is in the chat section. If you want a copy of the video or the materials, or if you have questions, I'll leave the meeting open for the next seven minutes, then I would close it. So please send in your questions. I'm already getting some questions. And uh, when we get the replies, just don't forget to send an email so that you can get your, your answers. All right, so I'm seeing questions. Keep them coming. Keep them coming. Okay, so we've gotten a lot of questions and we'll be sending it to them. So we'll be ending this lecture now. Thank you all so much for attending and you can leave the lecture room now if you would like to. Thank you.